Hi, it's Sue. Thanks for joining me for today's Bible reading. I am reading Ecclesiastes 9 through 12 today from the World English Bible. For all this, I laid to my heart, even to explore all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hatred, man doesn't know it. All is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good, to the clean, to the unclean, to him who sacrifices and to him who doesn't sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath as he who fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one event to all. Yes, also, the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. For to him who is joined with all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead don't know anything. Neither do they have any more a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy has perished long ago. Neither do they any longer have a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Go your way, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. Let your garment be always white and don't let your head lack oil. Live joyfully with the wife from whom, with the wife whom you love all the days of your life of vanity, which he has given you under the sun, all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life and in your labor in which you labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work nor plan nor knowledge nor wisdom in Sheol where you are going. I don't know if that's true. I think uh, people have gone to heaven and come back, and even to hell and come back. There's there's things going on there. It's not oblivion. They're actually in a place. Interesting concept there, or thought. Verse 11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. For man also doesn't know his time, as the fish that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, even so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly on them. I have also seen wisdom under the sun in this way, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city and a few men within it, and a great king came against it, besieged it, and built a great bulwarks against it. Now a poor wise man was found in it, and he by wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then I said, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the cry of him who rules among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Dead flies cause the oil the perfumer to produce an evil odor. So does a little folly outweigh wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at the right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yes, also when the fool walks by the way, his understanding fails him, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. In the spirit of a ruler, excuse me, if the spirit of a ruler rises up against you, don't leave your place, for gentleness lays great offenses to rest. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, the sword of error which proceeds from the ruler. Folly is set at great dignity, and the rich sit in low places. Excuse me, in a low place. I have seen servants on horses and princes walking like servants on the earth. He who digs a pit may fall into it, and whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever carves out stones may be injured by them. Whoever spits wood may be endangered by it. Did I say spits wood? Whoever splits wood may be endangered by it. If the axe is blunt and one doesn't sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength, but skill brings success. If the snake bites before it's charmed, then there is no profit for the charmer's tongue. The words of a wise man are gracious, but a fool is swallowed by his own lips. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also multiplies words. Man doesn't know what will be and that which will be after him who can tell. The labor of a fool wearies every one of them, for he doesn't know how to go to the city. 
Woe to you, land, when your child is king. Excuse me again. Woe to you, land, when your king is a child and your princes eat in the morning. And I find that really interesting talking about the king being a child. How many leaders have you seen? I know I've seen a good handful through the years that were children emotionally and mentally. It's it's not a good thing when someone like that's in, in charge with the judgment of a child. Let me read that again. Verse 16. Woe to you, land, when your king is a child and your princes eat meat in the morning. Happy are you, land, when your king is the son of nobles and your princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. By slothfulness, the roof sinks in and through idleness of the hands, the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter and wine makes the life glad and money is the answer for all things don't curse the king no not in your thoughts and don't curse the rich in your bedroom for a bird of the sky may carry your voice and that which has wings may tell the matter i personally believe that's a spiritual issue right there because i think if if we what we say and think in private you know in the private of our own heart and what we what we think and, and allow to allowed to be a part of our belief system, I think it it does affect, um, it has an effect. If if I'm here hating and despising the king, as this says, cursing the king, I think it's going to affect my relationship with the king directly or indirectly, because it's a, I think it's a spiritual principle as well. I don't know if I can't really explain that, I guess, but I've always thought that. Tell me in the comments if you, if you kind of get the gist of what I'm saying with that. Um, it's kind of a, a reap what you sow principle. Uh, chapter 11, cast your bread on the waters for you may find it after many days. Keep a portion to seven. Yes, even to eight for you don't know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls toward the south or toward the north in the place where the tree falls, there shall it be. He who observes the wind won't sow and he who regards the clouds won't reap. As you don't know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, even so you don't know the work of God who does all. In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening don't withhold your hand, for you don't know which will prosper, whether this or that, or whether they will both be equally good. Truly the light is sweet and is a pleasant thing for the eyes to see the sun. Yes, if a man lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth, and walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Chapter 12, last one. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw nigh, when you will say, I have no pleasure in them, Before the sun, the light, the moon, and the stars are darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look out of the windows are darkened, and the door shall be shut in the street, when the sound of the grinding is low, and one shall rise up at the voice of a bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Yes, they shall be afraid of heights. And terrors will be on the way, and the almond tree shall blossom, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goes to his everlasting home, and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is severed, or the golden bowl is broken, the spring or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Period. That was all one long run on sentence all the way from the beginning of that chapter so eight verses there and i think it's interesting it says before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken um that is thought to be that silver cord is thought to be the cord that holds your spirit to your body isn't that interesting and you can look that up there's a lot more to that um And the golden bowl, I believe, our brain. 
but I know it's a little bizarre, but look it up. The um the silver cord, this is well, like I said, this is a little bizarre, but those that um that practice astral projection, which we're not allowed to do, God forbids us to do that outside of his um, authority. You know, this is like new age practice. But they say that if that silver cord is broken while they're astral projection, they can't get back in their body. And I've listened to more than one uh, converted witch that said that. And there's just more to it than that. I don't, I don't know. I just think it's an interesting subject. I'm not saying that's exactly what it is here because I haven't researched it out. I just think it's a point of interest because it says right here, before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken. And it goes on to say, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So it makes sense, right? But I haven't personally seen it. So I'm just telling you what I've heard. Verse nine, further, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered, sought out, and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought, let me stop also right here. Okay, so this last part, chapter nine, I'm sorry, verse nine to the end is the conclusion of this book. So if, if you watch that Bible project introduction that's linked in the comments, I mean that <clears throat> description, this book has an introduction and conclusion written by the author. And in the middle, it's quoting the teacher slash preacher. Some people call him teacher, some preacher, or I should say some versions call him that. So from at least from what Bible Project explained, there is an author, but the this preacher teacher speaking in the middle, whole middle part is not necessarily the author. So here we are back to the conclusion, and you may understand it better now with that ex explanation. Verse nine, further, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered, sought out, and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written blamelessly, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails, well fastened, or words from the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Furthermore, my son, be admonished. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is the weariness of the flesh. This is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every hidden thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. And that's the end of the book of Ecclesiastes and the end of today's reading. Thanks for joining me. God bless you.